Oh, uh, and you know, my, my question is basically what kind of thinking <clears throat> seems to be called for by these um, parties that I mentioned earlier, so thought leaders, politicians, journalists, et cetera, et cetera, in order to make sense of the tech industry and its impact on our lives. Put another way, um, what according to a certain kind of tech infused zeitgeist makes for bold, um, impactful, riskful, creative thinking, independent thinking, right? All the kind of thinking that we're supposed to, be, to, to want to do, right? Um, and is the kind of thinking that conforms to this kind of zeitgeist actually any of those things? Um, if this is very abstract, um, let me um, start with me with an example. <clears throat> um, there's a broad, albeit far from uh, general agreement, that thinking that is somehow independent uh, and disruptive is better, is somehow more authentic um, and is more likely to be right. Um, and you can find that you know, on medium posts as much as you can in, in um, seminars and TED talks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and, and this idea that this is something that we ought to be fostering in young people is one that, that uh, even academics uh, largely subscribe to or many academics subscribe to. Um, by contrast, you know, thinking that relies on old institutions, on possibly outmoded traditions, on accumulated wisdom um, of scholarly fields or modes of inquiry um, are supposedly no longer totally up to the task. Uh, and basically with something like that, with, with, with a, with a uh, propo proposition like that, um, there are two basic questions you can ask, right? Uh, first, why and how did we decide that disruption was a good in itself, right? What is the, the what is the career of that idea? And second, um, is the discourse that offers itself as disruptive in reality any such thing? And I think I can give away my answer, uh, even if you haven't read the book, uh, is that many of the discourses around tech rebrand basically <clears throat> as dissidence, what is in fact conventionality, rebrand as disruption, what is in fact continuity, and rebrand as revolution, what is in fact the maintenance of the status quo. And then that I think raises kind of a third question, which is to say, how, how did we, <clears throat> I, I called in the book, I call this at some point, uh, a, a kind of re, uh, imaginative capture, rather, rather than a, regulative ca a re regulatory capture, these, these, this, this sector of the economy has somehow captured what we think is possible and what we think constitutes certain, certain standards. Um, and and my, my question in the book then is, well, how did this kind of, how did, how did that trick work? How, how does it, uh, how, how did disruption get sold to us as this, this thing when it is in fact, um, probably not quite what it pretends to be? Um, so what Tech Calls Thinking is about, um, it's not about how tech influences or what it does to the world outside of it. Um, it's about how the tech industry is always already part of our world, right? It's not something we can detach from um, from any aspect of our of our lived reality. It's not, you know, and, and the pars pro toto of Silicon Valley is on the one hand, it's it's a projection. It's a way of of um, uh, of getting of of having someone who knows where the journey is going, for whether for good or for ill, someone that you can look over to and it tells you what the future is gonna look like. And the, the truth of course is that this is far more <clears throat> uh, deeply anchored in, in all of our everyday lives. Um, and, and so it's, it's about the way tech reshapes our world, but it's always already also part of, of that world, right? I, I say a couple of times in the book that, you know, if, if tech didn't exist, uh, the, our current mode of capitalism would have to invent this, this industry because it proves exactly what certain actors, both state and non, uh, want to have to be true, want to be true. Um, so it's about this very strange object that's constructed by very visible exponents of, of the tech industry itself, uh, but also by the press, by politicians, by TED talkers, by pundits, et cetera, et cetera. And that works very hard um, to make certain ideas seem incontrovertible and um, make certain developments seem inevitable. Uh, and my book is basically a catalog of, of seven of such ideas. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I'll, I'll give a couple of examples, right? So for instance, <clears throat> I ask, um, 
where the idea comes from that dropping out of college means that you're a more independent thinker than someone who actually finishes college, right? Um, I, I don't have an opinion on this one way or the other, but it's, I think it's interesting that our zeitgeist does have an opinion on this one way and not the other. Um, a second example, I ask where the idea comes from that within our vast archives of, of, of human uh, labor, um, whether these you know, be um, you know, platforms like Yelp or, um, or um, you know, uh, various, uh, you know, Google News or something like that, the labor of the person who builds the platform is more central and more valuable ultimately than the labor of the person who fills the platform with content, right? How did we decide that? <clears throat> what goes into that? And what are the ramifications of that? A third example, I, I, I tried to find out where the idea comes from that communication <clears throat> is always an unalloyed good and that communication simply means uh, basically the transmittal of information. And that all the stuff that might surround that transmittal, right? Uh, the customs we have around transmittal of information, the <clears throat> values that track when we share information, et cetera, et cetera, are actually dampers on the freedom of this inf information uh, rather than an important shaping force to how it is transmitted. Um, I ask about the idea of the genius programmer and where that came from and how the kind of solitary, slightly abrasive hacker of the popular imagination um, is used to distort what are, after all, um, when you walk across one of these campuses, these vast collective undertakings, right? Um, these are huge groups of people working together. And yet, uh, when Hollywood comes to depict it, it's, it's Jesse Eisenberg um, acting the hell out of his Mark Zuckerberg um, and making it seem like he, he basically runs the show by himself. Um, and I, show, I try to show the way that this kind of focus on the lone, usually male genius has some terrible consequences and repercussions for women and minorities, for instance, who work in these companies, but, it, but that the consequences extend far beyond them as well. And then uh, the final example I'll give is that I, I looked into where the idea comes from that, um, uh, or, or where, where the idea of revolution goes in Silicon Valley. The idea that, <clears throat> um, that tech always seems to be to revolutionize and there seems to be a basic belief that these technologies will be able to revolutionize just about anything. Um, the only thing that it somehow miraculously never touches is who is rich and who is poor um, and, or who's in power and who's not. Uh, so this, this way in which revolution um, on the one hand is, is um, everything is susceptible to revolution and ought to be revolutionized. But on the other hand, some things that traditionally, let's say, um, folks have tried to revolutionize are, are left miraculously untouched by these disruptions. So these are the kinds of things I look at in, in the book. And as you can tell, it's, it's both um, a stock taking of the tech industry and a kind of um, attempt to sort of do a second order observation. Think about why are we looking at this at this industry at all? Why are we interested in it at all? Why, you know, this, this, this you know, when, when I, when I, a professor of comparative literature started reading, writing this book, I thought, well, why am I writing this book? But also, why was I asked to write it, right? What, what is it the kind of, you know, you wouldn't ask, ask a comparatist to, to please write a book about the pharmaceutical industry. And so um, that's, that, that was my question. What, what is it, why is our look at Silicon Valley different than the way we'd look at Detroit, for instance, or the way we'd look at, you know, lower Manhattan or something like that. Um, and, and so it's, it's both about, about this industry and how it shapes our thinking, but also the way it um, kind of tells us with which, uh, with which um, categories really to approach um, it and its operations. So I think I'll leave it at that. Great, thank you so, so much. Um, Bianca, do you wanna come in and say a few things? Yeah, I wanna say just, just a couple because I'd, I'd really like to spend our time in conversation with everyone here. Um, so thank you very much um, for inviting me to take part and um, Adrian, thank you for your book. Um, I have it right here and I truly would recommend everybody here read this. Here's how big it is in this time. Um, and it, it um, is fantastic. And I wanna, I guess my, my first point about this book relates to the work that I've been doing for a while with others I'm in community with on sort of advocacy about technology and, and how, do we, how do we as the public um, and residents sort of weigh in on this stuff politically. And um, 
it, it's overwhelming for a lot of people. One of the things I hear about, you know, whether it's people saying, well, I'm not really feeling sure I should have Alexa in my home, or I'm not really sure I should be adding these, you know, taking Uber, or I have concerns about the business model or, but, but they're doing it anyway, because it feels so inevitable. And so I think um, that also makes it hard for people to engage politically in some of these topics, because it just feels futile. And I think, Adrian, what your book did for me was really name that and look at it and look at how that power is being exerted um, by an industry, because that's really political. You know, like that is very, very political, not just the active things that are happening, but the very um, the, the very approach that this industry has taken to say to people, this is the future. Come along. If you don't want it, something must be wrong with you because this is all wonderful. And not just to residents and to citizens, but also to governments. And I think um, it has been profoundly difficult to move the conversation into some of these bigger rhetorical discussions we need to have about power, labor, and the things you've talked about, um, because politicians haven't felt comfortable challenging this industry, and they want to be seen as pro-technology, they want to see pro-innovation, and um, it is incredible what a force this rhetoric is about innovation and good and newness, um, when even that's questionable, right? So I think the first point I wanted to make was that um, a lot of people are concerned about technology because of issues related to surveillance and privacy, which are very important things. Um, but they, in, in my mind, in terms of rhetoric and political issues, they actually sit below this broader discussion around agency, control, power, the public's engagement on these things, uh, democratic direction on these things. Um, and so I, I was just so grateful to read this book because you, you, you take it apart, you know, you move through the chapters and you look at each of the places where there's this narrative. And um, I think the, the second thing that feels just important to raise is that the technology industry is now not just, and I think it's like, what is the technology industry is a bit of a confusing, that's already, we, could, we should talk about that. But the ways that some of the technology companies are surfacing in our public, um, assets and in public services, whether we're talking about, and right now in the pandemic, two prime examples are health and education. There is movement into digital spaces in both of those sectors that is happening at an incredible rate. And where we're at in our democratic, you know, in sort of liberal democracy right now, the reason this is really quite concerning to my mind is that because we've let our states in some get so decrepit in terms of like public health policy, for example, you can have private actors coming in and saying, you can't trust your governments. This is too important to trust your governments. They're failing. So it's our turn. And that has currency right now. And this is to me a really concerning issue because it's not, it's not untrue. And when you talk about continuity, I mean, there's been a privatization particularly accelerated since the 1980s in terms of, you know, public service um, delivery and provision yeah. being mediated through, you know, whether it's the accounting firms or, you know, like consultants, both at the policy level, but also in, in our technology. And so I just think that second example um, is important to the moment we're in because the call for me here tonight is for people to also know, like, you can engage with these things. There's more and more people doing so. Um, it can be adjacent or complementary to lots of other political action, but there are ways to intervene. And I think um, the, last, the last point I'd like to make is a little piece of history that I think gets lost when we talk about technology and the government, which is many of the IT divisions or shops, sectors, ministry, I mean, there's not really uh, a ministry of uh, technology in, in Canada, but um, the places where in the bureaucracy IT sits, these tend to be places where the people who work there were in charge of asking you if your browser was up to date, if your email was working, was your workstation functioning? That's, that's where IT was born in the state, in the government, in our bureaucracies. The decisions they're making now, 40 years on, relate to 
hiring, transportation, public service provision, legal services, bail, like this, this slide of how technology is being applied to our democracy, nobody here in this room and in many other places signed off on that. So the mandate of the people who work in the bureaucracy with technology um, has, has really expanded and we haven't intervened as a public. And so that's a really critical place that I, that's why I invite everybody here to both feel we can talk about it for us to intervene because no one signed off on that. And now we're doing a whole bunch of stuff that comes with all kinds of attendant risks and issues um, that we don't have policy or laws in place for. And policies and laws don't catch everything at all. I think social norms, as we've talked about, are very powerful too. Um, but, but those were the thoughts that, you know, that your book prompted, I think, in terms of this moment. And I felt very much that this work is one that invites people to gain some agency, you know, to try to get some, some power back and, and use the words to, to, to show up and to start to try to retain and grow control. So I guess like kind of back to you, Adrian, on that prompt, like I think you, you, you and any thoughts just immediately on that piece of it, how it ties into the political directly in, in democracy? Yeah, I think that's, that's a absolutely correct or absolutely wonderful reading of, of the book. <clears throat> it means to take control of, it, it means to say if, if, uh, there are, if there are powerful forces telling you that what your eyes are telling you is incorrect, uh, there's, a good, there's a good chance uh, you ought to be taking a, a second look and trust your instincts a little bit, right? An um, example I always give here is, you know, the way we're told that, you know, uh, cab companies are going to be done away with because Uber is far more efficient. It's true, taxi companies are losing a lot of money uh, these days. Well, so is Uber, but there's an entire cottage industry dedicated to telling us how one of those two things is not like the other. Well, it may, it may you know, uh, to you and me, the losing of tons of money might feel very similar, uh, but this is in fact a different kind of, this is a disruptive losing of money, you see. And so therefore um, you shouldn't, you, you know, you, this is not a failing business. It is, in fact, a, a, a thriving one, uh, except it thrives by, by hemorrhaging cash. Um, so exactly, this, the, the way we can, we can assert agency the, uh, and control is precisely by reclaiming or forcing themselves to vindicate themselves um, uh, the, the categories that are being offered to us as the analytic categories for uh, uh, for you know, these technologies that are changing all of our lives. And, and, and I think that um, that's, that's the thing that maybe wasn't as clear in my introduction. Um, I actually think that, um, so when I first, uh, the book came out in a series and, and when I talked to the series editors about it, they said, you know, what we, we, we don't, the one thing we don't really wanna do is we don't wanna be, uh, we don't really wanna be sycophants and we don't wanna be scolds, right? Um, we don't wanna just tell everyone like, put your iPhone down and we don't wanna tell people your iPhone's great. Um, and, and part of why that really resonated with me is because I realized um, the kind of powerlessness, the kind of lack of agency that you describe is actually something that I get from my colleagues in the humanities a lot too, who are like, you know, we're all doomed and it's all gonna end and, and like Zuckerberg is gonna control everything or, you know, it's like, no, he's not. It's like a, it's like a big car company. They, you know, they come, they're, they're powerful and that one shouldn't discount that. And, and you know, governments can use this technology to become quite powerful and that's bad um, possibly, um, but um, um, dystopianism is as easy as, is as cheap and easy a way out as utopianism because it's seeding that middle ground where exactly all these questions of agency, control and power come up where you say, this much I'm comfortable with and this much I can live with, but not this. And here's how I articulate that difference. Or, well, you know, the, the pessimist doesn't have to do that either, but the, the tech booster doesn't have to do that either. And I think that uh, my book's kind of making a case for that, that big middle ground and saying, you know, um, no reading on a Kindle is probably not worse than reading a paper book. Feel free to read my book on your Kindle, right? Um, there are other questions to be asked about the Kindle and that's fine. Um, but um, I, I do think that that's, that that's incredibly important that, that both the kind of cyberpunk pessimism that we sometimes get, and then the kind of, the kind of you know, Elon Musk venerating optimism that we get, both actually seed, they, they, both, they both just sort of throw up their hands and say, well, if someone knows where this journey is going, we're just along for the ride. And that, uh, you can't do democracy if people are think, think that there is something that they are just party to without any 
well without any right to change it, but also without any accountability for what's happening, right? Because then mm-hmm. you just say, then you just end up saying, well, I mean, no one asked me, as you said, like, right? I mean, like, but but the whole point is, then you should make yourself heard and and intervene, right? And and yeah, and I think that that's that's uh, that's very key. Yeah, and I think that the the um, this sort of middle ground space is a really timely one to talk about for a minute because um, this idea of it's all good or it's all bad, you know, this sort of binary, which is also very related to computers, um, yeah. is which we should talk about for a sec too, um, is, is not uh, getting us to the discussions of, and this is, again was so confirming to see in your book, things like efficacy, like does the technology even do the thing it says it does? Yeah. And it has been bananas to watch how many things can get all the way through, you know, like all the way through into into popular normal use um, without efficacy being the, a fundamental, you know, like that the idea of the thing is enough, never mind whether it works or not. And and you speak to that. And I think like that sort of um, fit, like that people don't ha- do like due diligence as a concept is somehow going out the window right in the moment of, you know, this pr- proliferation of technology um, is, is, is quite concerning. And I, I don't know, like from historically speaking, maybe just like why this, is there anything that you, you know, come across in your path to, to writing about this that you, that would help expand this a bit? Because this, this to me, again, it doesn't fit neatly in, is this a privacy or a security, but like, this is a, this is a mindset thing. This is like journalists don't ask mm-hmm. questions about efficacy. Yeah. Journalists aren't doing that work for us. Yeah, I so say I think I think that there there's a couple of there are a couple of uh, uh, um, answers there, and and I have to say that this is might be where the book is a little U.S. centric. Um, to me, that like part of the story here clearly is that the tech industry grows out of the imaginary of of Reaganism, right? That there is a kind of idea here that. Um, um, uh, oh, there was a question about an example of failure of efficacy. Maybe I'll give a quick one. Um, now, I should say I'm not a I'm you know I'm 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 a literature professor, but you know one of the things that you often hear is you know like all the horrifying but all the horrifying potential for facial recognition software, um, and it is one of those things where where if you talk to the people who work in the field, they're like that's not. Good. Let's put it this way: that cannot happen yet because it, see, it turns out the technology isn't there yet, right? Or um, so. So there, I think there are these places where our imagination kind of run leaps ahead of uh, of what's even possible. Um, so that might be one example. You might have others, um, but but you know um, where we kind of assume that the that the thing that someone um, uh, that someone uh, ha, ha, you know. Um, you know, so we, we look at someone's sales pitch and we suddenly think this is a description of the future, right? Um, and that can be for good or for ill. But like if, you know, if someone tells you on TV that this thing slices a tomato in, you know, under three seconds, you're like, you're not going to just believe that. And somehow, yeah, but, but somehow when it's a, it's a press release from a tech industry, from a tech company, People, you know, Theranos would be another one of these examples where, you know, the the, the experts in, in you know, in, in biotech were always like, that seems really unlikely that this could actually work. Um, you know, good for them if it does, but we're not holding our breath. Um, and yet, um, un- until the Wall Street Journal sort of blew that thing up, you know, I, I look back and a lot of the coverage didn't even ask the question, like, is this real? It asked, what, what if this were true? How interesting would that be? And like, yeah, but that's not really good journalism, right? Like, what if there was not toxic sludge, uh, you know, f- flowing into this river? Like, yeah, but the, like the important question seems to be whether there is or not. And, you know, if I'm getting a diabetes test, I'd like to know whether it's effective or not. Yeah. Um, so, but, but um, uh, so I think that would be an example of, of, of a failure of efficacy. But, but the, so I, my answer where this comes from is partly about, it's about this imaginary of government is always the problem. Yeah. And, and because we want to have things happen in our lives anyway, right? Uh, just because the government we're told or to trust the government to do it is naive and stupid. Um, someone else has to do it. Well, why not this nice 35 year old man who, you know, <clears throat> you know, who uh, stands in front of a large green screen and, and explains things to us, right? Like there is a, um, I, I think that, that this is just, someone has to offer an answer at a point where a 
a certain part of, of the political landscape is just completely allergic to, um, well, not just the state, to, to, to kind of traditional actors, right? Um, oh, hey, maybe a union would be good. Well, we can't have a union, but we can have this newfangled thing that is that walks and talks kind of like it, but isn't quite that, you know. Um, so I think that that's a that's a um, that, that that would be my answer. That, that mm -hmm. this is really a kind of a, a particular mode of neoliberalism that we're living through. Yes, and I think um, great example is given in the chat: uh, self-driving cars. Oh yeah. Oh, I didn't see that. Fantastic. Yes. Right. And and the one that's Canadian um, that I rarely talk about because the steam and smoke will start surfacing right out of my ears is uh, the exposure notification app that the federal government and other provinces have been pushing uh, in coronavirus. And the reason that this stuff concerns me, not like the efficacy, I mean, never mind that we just, and I, the fantastic articles going on right now about um, an error in, you know, a, a long, long error in transmission science um, and understanding aerosol transmission of coronavirus and taking things that are not even understood about this, about coronavirus and imagining how last year people were trying to write technical requirements for an app on a cell phone. Right. Like, the mind boggles right and what is what is wild about this is in terms of efficacy track record not good on apps like this even if there is some marginal you know use or yes of you know some cases um might have been identified i think the danger is much more so in the idea that in the discourse in canada which could have shut and from a good public health perspective being way ahead of this is now you still got the federal government pushing people to install technology when that when when what good public health policy looks like is very far away from an app and once you're at app as the thing you're telling people to do even as part of your menu of what you're doing in public health um we should be concerned and so i think this is such an example of your work again adrian because it's actually the it's the rhetorical it's the like let's bring this out and showcase it and yeah. in and the opportunity cost is we're not actually learning about public health how do we hold the government accountable for our public health policy when this toy is the thing that we're being told to use. I mean, that is deeply concerning. Yeah, and then there, then, then there's, um, you know, and, 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 and I think so, so that's an example, I, I absolutely agree. I think that's an example where, we're, where the opportunity cost is that we're wasting the time that could have been spent actually battling a deadly disease. And there are other examples, I think, where it does even more, where it degrades our existing conceptual arsenal. The example for this is always Nextdoor, um, right? The app that you can use to sort of recreate your neighbor, neighborhood virtually, right? There's an infamous example, um, uh, you know, where, yeah, if, uh, where you had to uh, download an app in order to communicate, uh, to, to go to uh, so-called neighborhood meetings with your local police. That meant that if you were not a customer of that app, um, you did not count as a member of the community. And it took a little while for the Seattle Police Department to be like, this is creepy, we can't do this, right? I mean, like there, there are definitely people who are members of the community who we want to be in touch with who do not have a smartphone. Um, you know, it, it positions the smartphone havers as the citizen and mm -hmm. the people they take pictures of because they freak out over them. And, you know, it's the United States, so you can guess how those two groups look vis-a-vis -vis each other. Um, uh, you know, they're basically gonna, um, you're making incredible distinctions, distinctions that, again, in the United States are life and death, right, whether the police is called on you or you call the police on someone else, uh, you know, as we have seen, costs thousands of Americans their lives every year, um, right, and, and, and people would probably know that if they had to pick up a phone and call 911, or if the police said, well, that person, we don't feel responsible towards them because they're homeless or whatever, but somehow, uh, the, the shininess of the app that you have to download um, masks the degradation of, of these kinds of categories like citizen, like community, uh, like neighborhood, right? Um, that we actually, that we suddenly are being fed and we are supposed to be content with a much narrower definition of that and one that reproduces privilege and, and, and in a way that is really that hopefully many of us, if that happened to us, in, in, you know, out, outside of our uh, a cell phone app, we would say, that's not okay. This person is, is part of this and ought to be included. Yeah, and it's, there's so much in there. And, and the, um, what we lose by, and this is, I 
just got a prompt here to, to maybe bring Marshall McLuhan in a little Toronto connection. Um, yes. But in terms of like how we misunderstand communication and language and community, right? Like exactly what you're saying. Like it's, it's, right. it's, it's, it's even in this pandemic um, being incredible to experience what a public meeting um, is supposed to look like. Cause just to offer this very real example is on one hand in the pandemic, sometimes more people are able to join a meeting because they don't have to go to the physical place, even from an accessibility right. perspective, which is really important. Yeah. Um, but what, what doesn't happen is the conversations that you have with your fellow residents in the room to the side after, before, you know, like to hear from each other. So this right. intra-community piece is not the focal point, right? So you, you really start to like hone in on who has power even in, in these, you know, how these platforms and technologies mediate, which I think brings us to like um, Marshall McLuhan's work, which I have not read uh, extensively, but I see referenced often and I'm really in intrigued more and more because I think some of what he has shared and what I've read um, this secondhand uh, has been really accurate in terms of like how the this sort of medium is the message mm -hmm. and that that the how we use these things is actually and, and because as I understand it, then I'd, I'd love you to you know fix this because I won't get it right but basically that like the content isn't as important as the ways that the technologies um, are bringing us together. And I'm not getting exactly right. So you please fix it and maybe expand a bit on that and how it relates. Well, I mean, the, I mean in general, you're, you're right. Um, and, and McLuhan is probably the most ambiguous figure in, in of the, that. I, so in each of the chapters, I sort of try to connect to, to a thinker. McLuhan is one of them. <clears throat> and I have um, both gotten emails saying that I'm too reliant on McLuhan. I shouldn't believe everything I read in McLuhan. And one that is, and one from a McLuhan biographer who was incensed at my my brutal attacks against McLuhan. Um, I didn't think I did either of those things. It's like there is a, a lot going on in McLuhan, and and some of it is exactly like you you look at that and you're like, how did this man, <laughs> sixty years ago, seventy years ago, um, say this? And like you know, if he if he woke up now, he'd just be like. Well, wow, I just, uh, I nailed that one. Um, but then there are other things that I think um, where he, where uh, I think especially when it came to how to then think about um, <clears throat> about the, our, our media. Um, I think that that where tech ended up taking some pretty calamitous lessons away from, from McLuhan and it came sort of, it route, got routed through sort of through the hippie counterculture who got very into, into uh, McLuhan for reasons I go into in, in the book. And I can say a little bit more if, if, uh, um, if, if the hometown crowd is interesting. Um, but um, basically, yeah, the, the, the idea of the medium being the message, right, is that, that um, uh, media shape what is sayable in them and create the kind of receivers. Um, we're, we're, not, we're not neutral receivers of information. They're, they're basically, we are constructed by the, you know, by the, the, our forms of communication, um, as uh, as potential receivers of those kinds of communications, right? And that is to say that, I mean, the, 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 this comes out of an, another, I believe, uh, um, University of Toronto professor, right? Walter Ong, uh, right? Uh, about literacy and orality, right? Who's just saying, be, going from oral culture to literacy, literary culture is not just that you get your text a different way, mm. right? To be a listener, to, to be always, or to be positioned in the world as a potential listener of texts, right, who crowds around the campfire and listens to a bard or whatever we want to imagine is totally different from someone who goes up to a bookshelf and picks a book out of it, right? Like it's, it's not just the same amount of information differently conveyed or not even more or less information. You are a different person at that moment, right? Um, and and um, so, so I think that, that um, so, so McLuhan is, 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 is drawing on that, that quite a bit. Um, and I think, and I think he, he, he has a lot to teach us there. Where the problem comes in is that he ultimately is, um, he thinks, he, he, he's, he's a literature professor. He's trying to figure out how to analyze media. And he says, if you look at what the media, what, what TV, for instance, transports, you're wrong, right? The way to look at, 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 at TV is what kind of medium it is, not at what its message is. The medium mm -hmm. is the message. The problem, um, the problem that you that you get with that is that um, ultimately he ends up um, kind of endorsing a kind of technological determinism that was very much um, simpatico 
to the way the tech industry began to be set up in the 80s and 90s. That is to say, um, um, it, he kind of disabled the kind of communitarian aspects of it uh, and sort of thought like, no, it's ultimately the medium that decides how it is received. Interesting. Um, and, and precisely the kinds of things where it's like, where we can say to each other, please don't say it that way. Please don't send this letter. Or that is a, that is a very strange telegram to send me, right? Like that's the, all that stuff um, he, he thought was, was secondary and was ultimately distortive. And to focus on that, like the way a lot of his colleagues in the English department might, uh, was ultimately mis to misunderstand. And that's exactly how, how tech picked up on him, yeah. This is fantastic. And I'm, I'm writing the word friction and circling it because, and we got a couple yep. of questions here I want to get into in the chat yeah. in terms of being in community here, which is great. So I'm going to get to those questions. And just to say in, in this moment that the, um, the need for better discourse, right? Like to be able to go back and forth is to like how you get and make sure you're communicating well. So I think this thing between oral and written is like is profound because to be in democracy, you need to be in conversation, you know, like, and, and you need to be able to check, did I hear you? Did I get it right? Like a lot of gesture, you can, you can, um, you have to be good at going, at iterating and these things that smooth that and then say that you communicated um, is really, really problematic. So I, this, this is, there's a lot in here, which is so interesting, and it brings us to some of the um, the questions here. One of them, because uh, I think it's also about how we get organized in these technologies and how we use them. So question here is, does your book discuss the extent to which technology segments versus links populations? So how it sort of, you know, divide and then together, like network, yeah. network piece of it. The global, the global village, another, um, <clears throat> another McLuhanism. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I talk about that a little bit. Um, I, I, uh, <clears throat> it's something that fascinates me, and, and it's something that I, I, um, <clears throat> I, I think, on the one hand, <clears throat> someone like McLuhan really can, can help us see. <clears throat> but at the same time, I think there too, he tends to kind of think of the global and the local as kind of um, opposed, when in fact, right, we're, what, what we probably see is that um, <clears throat> Uh, global and local kind of get sort of tangled together in the way we make meaning online, right? <clears throat> that is to say, um, there's a kind of um, frictionless kind of communication online. I think the 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 the, the you circling that word is very smart. It, um, it there is a kind of um, there's a kind of fantasy of a frictionless communication <clears throat> online um, that that then sort of um, also has this kind of techno utopianism about about um, making um, uh, of making communication of creating communication <clears throat> globally, and that literally just often means people talking to each other. It's good when people talk to each other, <clears throat> and as you say, that's not no uh, people just talking to each other or at each other is not a good thing, right? Within you know it, with gesture, with a certain ethical framework, with a kind of communicative framework, yes, it can be wonderful. Uh, we should all do it. Um, but just but just the fact that we talked is not in itself a good thing. There's a an early example of this. Um, Steve Wozniak set helped set up at the Esalen Institute, which is this kind of new age retreat on the, uh, along Route One, <clears throat> but maybe two hours south of where I'm sitting right now in Big Sur. He set up a a link, uh, a satellite link between the first satellite link uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union in I believe 1981 or 82, <clears throat> and his explanation was that because the governments couldn't get together, the people would just communicate. But literally what he meant was simply, I think it was like some local rock band noodling and then like they would broadcast that to the Soviet Union. It's like, yeah, okay. But like, it's, I could see why this, why having this kind of uplink might be a useful thing, but just sending a signal is not the same, you know, you, you, yes, you're using communication correctly, but I think you mean, you mean by communication something far more. If you think that like, yes, Soviet citizens and American citizens or US citizens could at that moment um, exchange ideas. Sure, but that's not what he was doing. He was pinging a signal, right? And, yeah. and I think that's, that's really key here. Yeah, and, and I think that this, um, there's, there's a displacement, the physical and the digital, you know, like I think, I think this sort of separation of people from place in any kind of political environment is gonna be a problem. Cause like part of what our accountability mechanisms to each other relate to where we're geolocated, right? Like, so this yeah. idea that you can like abstract yourself out of your place and then engage. 
um, is, is, is a good thing to realize like why we need to go back to like, where are we and how our politics are need to be grounded in, in, in the land that we stand on. And, and there, there's a lot more to that, especially in Canada with its history. So it's really important. Um, and I just wanted to share like a, a piece that comes to mind. Ingrid Burrington does fantastic work on the history of the internet and infrastructure. Yeah. And um, one thing, just because it's as as we're talking, I'm thinking about like the cloud has been this one thing where where it it almost it it sort of it's, it's it's like it's pushing real life infrastructure, real physical infrastructure, and labor and people into this invisible place, and then that stuff is getting picked up and used. So it's just this sort of like lack of place. Um, it would be worth. She wrote this piece in the last couple of months. Um, I'll, I'll find the title. I'll drop it in the chat. Um, then another question in the chat. Uh, is do you think Ivan Illich has something to contribute here? And oh. and maybe if you have anything you can share to preface who that is and what his thinking's about a little bit, not to put you on the spot. <laughs> oh, I, I I don't know. I may have to punt on that. That's that's a that's a big one. Okay. Uh, yeah, let me think. Um, oof, I, I I wouldn't feel I wouldn't feel comfortable. Fair uh, enough. I, I, and... I do I, I do want to say one thing about the localism. <clears throat> okay, question, good. Yeah, yeah. Which is something that I didn't end up saying in the book very explicitly because I'd, I'd written a bunch of articles about it and I, I ended up it ended up not sort of making the grade, but I, I make it in one sentence, I think, which is to say <clears throat> that even this kind of kind of universalist abstracted thinking that we sometimes associate with tech companies, right, with, um, <clears throat> you know, Facebook's Facebook everywhere. Um, actually, of course, comes out of and when you live in this area, you can um, you can um, uh, you can you can really see this. <clears throat> it comes out of um, out of very specific um, <clears throat> out of very specific um, forms of, of, of you know patterns of life around here. There's a, a, an example uh, that I give. <clears throat> you know uh, you know I live not too far from where Uber has its headquarters, and I don't I live you know I, mean, I don't know where Yelp's now headquarters, but my, their old headquarters were not too far from here, and <clears throat> maybe. Four years ago, I drove to a place in the Central Valley of California, you know, heavily um, Latinx, uh, heavily uh, agricultural area, and I wanted to eat lunch. Um, and, and I pulled up Yelp, and I realized that the taqueria in front of which I was standing, which I wanted to see whether it was any good, um, well, it did not show up on Yelp, even though people just kept coming in and out, in and out, in and out. It didn't show up. What did show up were um, all the kind of things that a San Franciscan might like, right? Like fancy coffee shops and um, and the vegan place down the road, and 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 then I, I and that that really struck me. And so then I I pulled up uh, the Uber app um, just to sort of test the hypothesis. And you have to imagine I'm standing by the side of this road where basically everything going past me is a truck. Everything. I mean, and there it's just it's also either a beat up Toyota or it's a truck. And, and every car that I could see, you know, that, that was back in the day when they would show you what kind of car you were, was gonna pick you up <clears throat> um, uh, was a Prius, right? Which is the car of the Bay Area, but it's not the car of the Central Valley, right? And so the, these apps have a tendency to import San Francisco geography and, San, and the values of the people who created these platforms into any place that they move into, right? And they're gonna reproduce um, with blinders um, the space in which they come. So even when we think, that something is not hyper, not at all localized. It is localized. It's just localized for where I'm sitting right now. Um, it's it's the it's the it's the um, um, uh, the um, it's the it's the localism. It's the provinciality of Silicon Valley itself. And there's you know there's this idea of what is made visible or legible, you know, locally through technologies, and then who is like how are those things appearing you know by inputs from local or reviews and all of these things that shift um it kind of always reminds me of like this brings us in long old history to current moment is uh you know who who makes the map like the power inherent in laying down how things will be legible to others i mean it's it's really significant and these apps and these other you know spaces that say like this is here, here's the place, here's what's around it, or here's, here's like, we're setting the frame um, is the power that doesn't really get discussed as much. Again, I would say, cause it gets absorbed into the, um, the data technology, privacy security piece and not the, the concept of like, who's, who's defining this, who's drawing this thing in the first place, right? And, and right. how could that be 
communal. And I think um, to the point of like bringing this like locally and into like a city in which we, some of us may live, I live in Toronto um, and how to engage on this, um, you know, politically and whether locally, provincially or federally, let's say in Canada, um, one of the things that's been interesting is to push on um, procurement or mm -hmm. the state's uh, sort of big budget that it has that is used to, to buy technologies and then integrate them into, into society or into, you know, in, into local, you know, whether it's a city or anywhere else. Um, and I just want to share that that's, that's a really interesting place for intervention because it's not traditional like it's not a place that a lot of people have generally been showing up and saying hey what are you doing what are you buying mm -hmm. um but the reason that it's an interesting opportunity for people to engage politically is because um you know for those of those of you who if, if you think about like things the governments usually buy uh, anything from helicopters to pencils they're kind of like you know the kinds of goods that are done yeah. um whereas with software and the technology purchases it's making they're they're ever moving and so like both their yeah. purchase you know gives gives people room to intervene but also their ongoing shape and form and things like standards like things that we have used historically in the past to try to define how these technologies work um there are places to do that, you know? And it's just, it's kind of an interesting moment because I think in democracy, a lot of people are a little bit like, hmm, how do I participate be between right. elections, right? Or how do I how do I participate in this space um, outside of my vote? And so it's, it's, it's interesting, I think, to see both that kind of work become something more people are doing in cities all over the world. And I think about Germany as a place where like, I see um, a culture just to like, you know, go a little bit Toronto to Berlin um, where, uh, you know, governments want to be, again, like pro innovation, doing things and supporting the economy, but also being cautious about democracy. And I'm, I'm just kind of curious what, what what your thoughts are on on this as I'm as I'm sort of throwing them out there in terms of like thinking about your book, thinking about ways to intervene, you know, thinking about people participating, um, anything and anything in there. Yeah, I do think that, and, and this is another thing where where, where right where, where software can work. If if someone if if the local government controls some kind of app, right? It 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 decides who's a citizen. It decides who it is answerable to, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, intervention precisely consists of of um, building a broader picture of who your government represents and how the, what it means for them to be responsive to you <clears throat> i think that that's that's um that's extremely important but the other thing that i think we we may need to do and this is kind of a that's a global thing and i think it's one that's that's going to be the challenge of the next decade or two is to just build up um, i mean there was a question about the, the ethical frameworks um is for us to sort of build up <clears throat> um customs around some of these things mm -hmm. and to say like this is not done it's like yes mm -hmm. you, you are free to do it but we were all uh we will all um you know think you're a complete jerk for doing it and you know and it's not an acceptable behavior right um think of all the things that allegedly that people you know um are able to do online that they are that they would never say to your face well some people will say it to your face but um in, in an ideal world they wouldn't wouldn't say to your face um, so we, I can, maybe we'll talk a little bit about more what, what we meant by that. It, it's simply this. It's simply saying um, if, if communication is just not just the simple exchange of information, <clears throat> but is about a kind of praxeology, it's about it, but a kind of a kind of behavior, modes of behavior and a particular situation in which you're trying to make certain things happen. <clears throat> um, where we might also ask, are these good things that you want to make happen? Are these, are you know, are you going about them the right way, et cetera, et cetera? <clears throat> I, I talk a lot in my in my book about the troll as kind of someone who does who does the opposite of this. <clears throat> right? The troll will often come across as someone who is pretending to have a conversation with you, and you have to react, like say on Twitter, like three or four times, and be like, oh no, I'm just being trolled. This person didn't in any way mean to initiate communication with me mm -hmm. they were just they were just exchanging words with me right <clears throat> um and and the opposite of that is of course someone who approaches you with a clarity of purpose 
<clears throat> and who has you know a way for you to get back to them in ways that will inform how they think. I think that's how I think that's how both of us were sort of thinking about ethics, right? It's not sort of much of like is it good or bad, <clears throat> but it is to say creating conditions of efficacy for each other, saying you can affect me in this way if you can explain to me why I shouldn't do this. For mm-hmm. instance. Or, you know, I hope to affect, affect, affect you in this way, not by calling you names and like making, or sending you horrible memes, but, but rather by, by saying, you know, he, here's why I think this is, this is a, what you're doing is a problem or is, is, not, is not right, et cetera, et cetera. And accountability, um, right? Like, and there's, there's a great comment I want to read here. Um, and accountability in ethical framework, right? Like, I think right, this, yeah. is, this is in democracy, again, like where we're having a real hard time is disagreeing and knowing that that's a natural element of doing governance together is you are going to disagree. So we need to figure out how we have accountability when we disagree, but we stay together in the work, you know, like that's kind of what accountability is about. And and so many digital um, media don't encourage it. So I just want to read this comment because it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's dead on Um, a related issue to what we're talking about in terms of control um, is the replacement of media you own such as DVDs and CDs with monopolistic subscription services, such as Netflix and Spotify. Once these services crush the legacy media, they can then curate and restrict the content you have access to. And I have to laugh because someone online the other day was saying, I cannot believe that I can't buy my software anymore. Like I can't buy it. It's not yeah. like I, it's the <laughs> subscription model, right? It's the rentier. Yeah. And it's, it's um, which is also interesting in a time when to bring us, and we have five minutes left, so I'll be quick with this comment, um, to, you know, we're in a climate crisis. We are having democracy problems. We're having technology accelerate some of our, you know, engagement with each other. Um, but at the heart of a lot of this stuff is private property and common law, like this idea that we own things. So we need to move to sharing them instead of maybe owning them in some of their cases, like as, as a model in our brain. And it's so interesting to tie it to this comment where the ownership, like you can't move things into community and into stewardship if you don't even have access to the ownership anymore. That's right. Right. So I think this is profound, not just on the technology layer, but actually in, in democratic practice. And, you know, a great work to look at is always Eleanor Ostrom's work on the commons mm-hmm. as a place that we could be going to your earlier point too, about communitarian, like there are other models we could be using technology in a really cool mm-hmm. way, you know, to, to talk to each other. Right, or I have an illage. I guess that now we did end up with him. Like there, there is a the kind, the kind of you know, a kind of uh, um, dehierarchized kind of sharing of of knowledge, uh, knowledge economy. Yeah. Yeah, I, and I, so on, on on a close here. Like I know that um, I, I just inter I just interrupted you. So do you want to just close that? No, go, go ahead. Uh, okay. No, go ahead. Um, just just to say that there's, and I think this, I have to say, if people can look up something called Polis, P O L dot I S. Um, I work with this group and it's just really neat to see an example of a technology platform that was used in Taiwan. So if you look up Polis and Taiwan, you can see technology being used in productive uh, democratic manner. Because I think Adrian, to your point, we're at this moment where we need to also like figure out how to use this stuff in a way that is helpful because there are ways to do that. And that's just one thing to share because I think these conversations have been so skewed to like, you're either against it or you're for it. And I think your book has given us so much surface area for like the middle, like to talk about it. So I just want to end by saying thank you and everybody who's here. And I want to hand it to you for the last word, Adrian, on, on anything. Yeah, I mean, thank you so much. These are, that's an amazing final thought. I, I don't know if I can, um, uh, if I can, if I can match, match that in, in its, in its uh, hopefulness. I think that there's, um, I, I, I'm, I'm just thinking about, about the ways in which we, um, you know, we 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 are being dispossessed of the common that we build ourselves, the one that we mm-hmm. build from the ground up, <clears throat> and being given instead the sort of simulacrum online. And and I think that that's that's something that 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 really um, that really worried me about the book uh, in the book, and that's that's something that 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 really sort of shaped the book because <clears throat> you know I'm you know the university is many things, and I'm not. I'm not particularly um, um, not particularly um, Pollyanna-ish about it, but one thing it is is it's a, it's a place where where people come together under without a whole lot of um, restrictions and 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 uh, work stuff out together, and and I am and and uh, the the way and, and the the kind of the kind of 
commons that can be created by people who want to make billions of dollars, you know, truly outlandish amounts of money. <clears throat> I, I, you know, color me a little bit more suspicious of, of those kinds of those, those kinds of offerings. Um, I think that there is a kind of um, uh, I, I think that there is a kind of uh, a really important uh, um, uh, uh, aspect to this is precisely that with the digital commons with the with um, with a, a return to to sharing <clears throat> would have to come a new conceptual arsenal because the conceptual arsenal mm. uh, that we are working with um, has been descended over the last 40 years by mm. <clears throat> forces that are that are meaning to foreclose the very options that you have just now described so so that, that's I guess another pitch for maybe reading my book and and, uh, and running with it. So yeah, thank you both very, very much, Adrian and uh, Bianca for, for joining us tonight. Um, this uh, meeting will be available on uh, YouTube in the coming days on the Good Institute Toronto YouTube site. So if you wanna share it with uh, friends, family, whoever you think might be interested, that'd be great. Um, we will be back in July with the book club with Pierre Jory, who's a translator of Paul Celan. Um, and we're very excited to have him. But again, thank you very, very much, Bianca and Adrian. Please get uh, What Tech Calls Thinking at your local bookstore. And um, Bianca, if you have a meeting coming up, do you have any, uh, do you have a, any meeting coming up? Any things that people should tag in on in Toronto? Yes. Yeah, two things. There's a Connect TO is the city is looking at an internet access policy to try to improve equity for internet access. So connect TO, if you look that up and you can submit some comments on that for the next week or so, just in terms of approach. And then the city is also putting together its digital infrastructure plan, which is a policy document that there will be consultations on uh, definitely in the next few months. Um, but those are two good things to read a bit about and you can you know involve yourself, contact it, just this, this is like my tiny request. Even if you just contact your counselor and ask them what they think of this stuff, that starts to set off a chain reaction of like, oh, what do we think of this stuff? Um, so it can be that light. It can be your first email or phone call you've ever made to your, to your local representative and that matters and helps. So those are, those are two. Great. Well, all right, thank you very much. Thanks everyone out there. Stay safe, be well, and uh, hopefully see you all soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you all, thank you all for being thank here. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. Good night. Okay.